What do you know about it, Chigilski? What do any of us know about anything? In the previous episode, we talked about the Pi Pico being used as sort of like a system console chip. And in particular, how it uh, was interfacing with the PS2 keyboard, basically taking in the PS2 keyboard scan code, converting it to ASCII, and then transferring that data through the level shifters to the VIA chip. Now today we'll be talking about a different function of the Pi Pico, mainly the reverse of that, which is data being sent from the 6502 through the Pi Pico on its way to the VGA subsystem. Now you may recall that with the PS2 keyboard, we use the VIA chip, specifically port A, to handle the handshaking and communication. The summary was that the information would be generated by the Pi Pico. The Pi Pico would put those seven bits of data on the port A pins on the VIA chip and then signal to the VIA that data was available to be read. Now the overhead of doing this handshaking and the corresponding 6502 interrupt, which coordinates that handshaking, uh, is pretty low, uh, especially when you're looking at the bandwidth of the PS2 keyboard. Not only is the PS2 interface pretty low bandwidth, but realistically, how fast can you type on a keyboard? And so the amount of time it takes to handle the handshaking and the 6502 interrupt really isn't a factor as far as being a limiting issue for the communication between the Pi Pico and the 6502. The reverse, however, is not the case. We want the communication from the 6502 to the VGA subsystem to be as fast as possible, in which case doing a sort of handshake or interrupt is problematic. It significantly reduces the bandwidth that we can actually talk to the VGA system. Instead, we'd have to talk directly to the Pi Pico. Of course, going through the level shifters because again, the 6502 is running at five volts and the pin outputs are five volts, whereas the Pi Pico is 3.3 volts. The simplest and easy way to do this is just to consider the Pi Pico as an external memory address that is selected when the specific address is put on the address line. Because we're looking at the Pi Pico as sort of basically a memory chip, we have to start worrying about the actual timing between the 6502 and the Pi Pico. That means that the timing diagram of the 6502 becomes vitally important. Now the time values for this particular uh, diagram right here is assuming a four megahertz clock on the 6502. Again, that means the full clock cycle is 250 nanoseconds with the clock off for 125 and the clock on for 125. Now when the 6502 is ready to write data on the address bus, it waits until the bus line, the clock line is low and starts setting up the address and the rewrite signals. And this means right here is that it's basically garbage. Uh, we can't really depend on anything that's being done. Anything that's presented on the address lines or on the rewrite line is basically to be ignored. It's not until the actual clock goes high 
that we see that we have a stable set of address lines as well as the stable read-write line. However, during that period of time, there is still a, a time frame where the 6502 is still setting up the data lines, that the write data, the data on the, the eight data lines, is still garbage and not to be trusted. And it's not until about 70 nanoseconds after the clock goes high will the write data, the data presented on the data pins, actually be valid and to be read. So that means that we have this amount of time, 125 minus 70 nanoseconds, to, to read the data. Now the issue with this is that these values change as we increase the clock frequency on the 6502. Uh, you double the, the, the clock speed on the 6502 to eight megahertz, and you are cutting this time frame in half, which means that you're having increasingly less and less time here to actually read the data that's being written on the data lines. The way we're currently resolving this issue is by triggering on the rising edge of the clock cycle and then delaying for about 70 nanoseconds plus the additional time it takes for some of these signals to propagate. Uh, recall that we have the uh, the chip select for the Pi Pico as well as any I.O. going through the PLD circuit, which adds about four to seven nanoseconds of delay. There might be some also some logic delays in there as well. So even though the maximum is 70 nanoseconds, we actually want a buffer of maybe 10 to 15 nanoseconds in addition to that to make sure that we are definitely reading at a time when the right data is valid. But those values change depending on the clock cycle. Now currently, as I said before, the way we resolve that is by uh, creating some delays inside here and making sure that we're reading the right data somewhere in this area here. But later versions of it, I think, have a much better solution where Instead, what we'll do is trigger on the trailing edge of the clock signal and then latch the right data here for an extended period of time. That way, the Pi Pico has plenty of time after the clock goes low to read that data available. Because remember, it does take time for the Pi Pico to read the data off the pins, as well as copy that data into its internal buffer. And so even though it looks like we might have a large period of time right here to do all that, even with the Pi Pico running at 250 megahertz with a four nanosecond clock cycle, you're really running up to the edge right here, especially as you start bumping up the clock frequency on the 6502. So let's actually look at the code and see how we use both DMA and the PIO, programmable input output capability of the Pi Pico to read this write data. Let's first review the logic that's used to tell the Pi Pico that there is data available on the eight 6502 bus data pins. And this is referenced in the PLD file that we talked about a couple episodes ago. Again, this is the file that takes care of the chip select and address decoding. In the particular case of the Raspberry Pi Pico, it's set up to respond to the address A800 and to be signaled when the read-write line is low, that is, we're writing data, well, the 6502 is writing data, 
that the address corresponds to some place in the I.O. block, that A111 is high, which corresponds to the A800 address, and that the clock signal is high. The combination of all of these determine when the PICO data rate line goes high. So now with that refresher out of the way, let's actually look at the PIO program that coordinates the communication between the 6502 and the Pi Pico. As a reminder, the PIO subsystem can be thought of as eight independent coprocessors, they're actually state machines, that run independent of the main CPU. And even though they are extremely limited, for example, the number of opcodes, commands available to the PIO program are very, very small, limited to things like reading and writing information, uh, basic uh, loops and jumps, waiting for events. You can only have 32 commands that define and create a PIO program. Even so, the PIO capability is super fantastic because, first of all, each command, each line in the program only takes one clock cycle. And these are independent of the CPU itself. So these are running by themselves in the background with no direct interaction with the CPU until we tell it to interact with the CPU. So in this particular case, this program is called memin. And even though not required, the first thing we do is we actually null out the input register. Now, this is actually done automatically, but I always think it's safe to do that uh, anyway, just in case. The next thing we do is that we're waiting for GPIO pin 26, which is the data ready pin, the one that signals to the Pi Pico that, hey, you've got data on the eight data lines coming in, that data is ready to be read, we wait for that signal to go high, which is the wait one. Once that's done, we also want to wait an additional 12 clock cycles. And recall that each clock cycle on the Pi Pico, because it's running at 250 megahertz, is actually four nanoseconds. We want to wait about 48 additional nanoseconds to make sure that we are in that sweet spot where the data information on the data lines are valid and stable. And after we wait those 12 additional cycles, which is what this brackets command right here means, we are ready to read in the data on those eight pins. We wait until the data ready line signal goes low, at which point we generate an interrupt. And this signals to the main program running on the main CPU that there is now data available in that input register to be read. Now you may recall that we wanted to avoid using interrupts on the 6502 side because it's running uh, much, much slower than the Pi Pico and the overhead can really get in the way, it can really be a limiting factor. Now we still have to worry about the overhead of the interrupt handling routine on the Pi Pico, but because we're running faster and because we're optimizing that interrupt routine, it's really not that much of an issue. The next thing we do is set up and initialize the GPIO pins that correspond to the incoming data that's coming in on those eight lines. And that's what this is and we're setting them up as output. So now let's see what the actual interrupt service routine does. Before we do, however, let's look at how we enable the interrupt for the PIO on data line GPIO 26. First of all, we create the PIO program and allocate a specific IRQ interrupt for that PIO state machine. We add the memory program that we just looked into it, 
and then set up the state machine so that the eight data lines are looked at, as well as initializing the data ready pin. The ready is a constant which points to GPIO 26, and we indicate that is an input line. We then enable interrupts for that PIO program. We set an exclusive interrupt handler called readmem as the interrupt handler to handle those interrupts, and then we enable it, at which point in time the state machine, the PIO program, is up and running in the background. Now we're actually looking at the interrupt service handler or interrupt service routine that handles the interaction between grabbing that data off that input register from the PIO program and storing it in a buffer to be used by the main program. As we mentioned before, the name of this program is readmem, and we're telling the C++ SDK that's used to compile and build this program to store this function not in Flash, but in RAM. The reason being that Flash access is quite a bit slower than RAM access, and because we want this interrupt service routine to run as quickly as possible, we want it to be running in RAM. Just like with the PS2 keyboard routine, the way the data is input into the 32-bit word, which is the input register, we need to shift those eight bits which are read in to the bottom end of that 32-bit word, so we actually get an eight-bit character from that data, which is what this line right here does. We then go ahead and re-enable the interrupt, and then check to make sure that we haven't overrun our buffer that stores the information. This line right here, in addition to shifting those eight bits down, also auto-populates the input buffer because the right pointer is pointing to the next available open slot. Now the actual routine that is being looped on in the main CPU program does two things. First of all, it calls the get byte program to see if the read and write pointer to the input buffer is the same or not. Now, if the read and write pointer are not the same, that means that we have data in the input buffer that we haven't read yet. We pull that information out, store it in the past pointer to the get byte routine, and then increment the read pointer. Again, ensuring that we don't overrun the buffer and then return a Boolean on whether or not we have read data or not. If the data has been read, if that value, if the return value of get byte is true, then we go ahead and print the character. And by printing the character, it means that we actually take that character that was read in and actually push it into the VGA subsystem. Because the VGA subsystem is itself a pretty large and complex uh, piece of software, it handles not only the signaling of the VGA subsystem itself, the horizontal and vertical syncs, but also handles generating the graphics, the text, and all the other functions associated with that, that will be the topic of the next video. Thank you again for stopping by and watching the video. Hope you appreciated it and you learned something from it. Again, if you have any comments or suggestions, don't hesitate to reach out either by Twitter slash X or by the comments below. Thanks again. See you next time.